Okay, here's a case you might not have heard of, and it's a crazy one. You know I like crazy. We've got a murdered millionaire. We've got an ex-king of England involved in the investigation. Plus, the tropical island backdrop of the Bahamas. I mean, like, this thing plays out like a straight-up Agatha Christie novel. Ooh, like the queen of crime herself? Okay, now I'm intrigued. Cool. Let's take a closer look at the case. Nassau, Bahamas, 1943. As World War II rages in Europe, a tranquil island in the Atlantic Ocean offers a stark contrast to the horrors of war. Yet even respite in paradise can become a grisly murder scene, as was discovered in a palatial mansion one stormy summer morning. Those crime scene photos look gnarly. Seriously, I mean, I don't totally know what we're even looking at. Yeah, okay, let's review. Hey, uh, can we take a look at those photos again, please? Who are you talking to? Our producer. He also does the uh, voiceover on the crime story stuff. Oh, okay, yeah, when, when I saw him earlier, I just thought he was some random crack-addicted bird that wandered into the studio. Nope, he's uh, pretty much running the show. Yeah, that actually makes perfect sense. Okay, uh, the photos, creepy pigeon. Let's take a look at those photos. Oh man, okay, so it, it looks like they initially bashed this poor fellow's head in. Then they attempted to set him on fire, but that didn't quite work. And there's just like feathers everywhere. I mean, these crime scene clues seem to point to the murderer being like a crazed goose. Maybe he got like high on bath salts or something and felt compelled to kill. Creepy Pigeon, is this one of your buddies? Have you been getting high with this serial killer goose? Agreed, yeah, this definitely screams bath salts or something all out chaos. I don't know, in my head, I'm seeing a scene from like an especially dark Benny Hill sketch. Okay, uh, so I think we're off to a great start. Everything we've uh, speculated on so far seems super plausible. Right, so we now have an overview of the crime, but let's get to the important part, victimology. Yeah, let's humanize this feather bedazzled corpse. Like, who was Harry Oaks? Who did he surround himself with? What was his favorite color? Who was his favorite beetle? The answer to these questions and more in the following montage. Take it away, Creepy Pigeon. Sangerville, Maine, 1874. Harry Oakes was born into an upper middle class family in a pastoral East Coast town. Harry's father was a prosperous lawyer and his mother a respected educator. One of five children, Harry did not feel pressure to follow in his parents' footsteps. As a teenage dreamer, Harry decided instead to set his sights on striking it rich as a gold miner. Oddly, this was something Harry's pragmatic family encouraged and financially supported. And so, after dropping out of medical school, Harry set out into the majestic wilderness. For 15 years, Harry would travel the world as a prospector in search of the gold mine he felt destined to find. From California to Australia, South Africa to Nevada, Harry sifted through massive amounts of dirt and continued to borrow money from family and friends to fund his ventures. By 1912, Harry was virtually penniless and barely able to afford food or clothing to keep him alive during the frigid Canadian winter. Despite these hardships and a ridiculously lucky turn of fortune, the determined prospector finally struck it super rich that year in a hidden mine near Kirkland Lake. 
Jeez, okay. Uh, Harry had some very understanding parents. <laughs> okay, what would you do if your kid was like, Mother, I've decided to drop out of college and become a professional poker player. I will need you to fund my ventures for the first 20 years. But I assure you, at approximately age 40, I will strike it rich and become self-sufficient. Why is my child from the 19th century? <laughs> oh wait, that's not a photo of your son? Creepy Pigeon, did you mix up the JPEGs? I don't care whose child it is. I'm not funding anybody's pro poker player pipe dreams. Well then, it seems this child will miss out on his chance of becoming a millionaire and a murder victim. Some mother you are. No, 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 no. He can still get murdered. We live in a capitalistic society. Equal opportunity murdering. After fulfilling his dream of incredible wealth, Harry, then 48, was on a world cruise when he met a charming 24-year-old Australian woman named Eunice McIntyre. The two married, and with a dutiful salute, the new Mrs. Oaks proceeded to birth five beautiful children. The idyllic family retired to a mega mansion in Niagara Falls. All seemed picture perfect, but there was something bugging Harry. The money he had worked so hard to wrestle from the earth was now gradually being siphoned from his savings via the guise of government income tax. Harry had become fiercely protective of his wealth, and he felt that the Canadian government was being overzealous in their tax grab. It was around this time that Harry became business partners with a man named Harold Christie. Harold was an impressive real estate magnate from the Bahamas. The two had become quite close, and in response to Harry's complaints, Harold suggested relocation for the Oaks family to the tax-free haven of the Bahamas. And so, in a move that some might describe as Scrooge McDuck-esque, Harry presented his middle finger to Canada, the land that gave him his millions, and jetted off to a tropical paradise he would soon call home. Well played. Don't let those maple syrup-blooded Canucks take your money, Harry. <laughs> I know, sort of a weird juxtaposition there. Because, like, Canadians have a reputation for being the nicest people. So here's Harry, like, Hell nah, fuck y'all. You ain't gonna get my money. And the Canadians are like, Oh, sorry about that. But, well, it's kind of the law, eh? But, you know, I get it. He worked hard for that money, and, like, life can turn on a dime. So it's best to be prudent and hoard all your riches. It's kind of perfect, because he became the stereotype of a crazy old prospector. You ain't gonna get your hands on my gold. <laughs> I don't know. Is, is, that, is that what prospectors say? <coughs> oh, right. You're just a figment of my imagination. Like, I could just wave my paw right through you and... <laughs> Oh, okay, I clearly do not understand this adaptation of reality. And we need to transition from this bit because it's getting kind of long and stupid. Yeah, 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 uh, let's see. Don't worry, I'm fine, everyone. So, uh... Now pay it to the crime story. Harry and his family quickly settled into island life. The gruff millionaire became a leading figure in the community by donating massively to charities. And social life became somewhat glamorous when in 1941, royalty was introduced. After being appointed governor, the exiled Duke of Windsor moved to Nassau, joining its elite social circles. The former King of England soon formed a friendship with Harry, drawn by a fascination with the self-made man who was now the island's biggest benefactor. Although life in the Bahamas was relatively drama-free, Harry's oldest child made a concerted effort to shake things up a bit. Feeling stifled by her overprotective parents and ridiculously privileged life, a teenage Nancy Oakes began a love affair with a French playboy. Alfred Dubarigny, or Freddie as he was informally known, was in his thirties and twice divorced. 
Despite the Oaks family objections, Nancy and Freddie secretly married in New York, just as Nancy turned 18. The scandal caused uproar in Bahamian society gossip. While Harry and Eunice didn't approve of their daughter's new union, they did wish for her happiness. Initial attempts were made to be friendly towards Nancy's new husband, despite his reputation. Yet these attempts eventually gave way to displays of discord that were noticed by the public. It was clear that Mr. and Mrs. Oakes felt Freddie was a fortune hunter, and furthermore, a general personality clash existed between Harry and Freddie. The two men both had big egos that would often clash. Reportedly, during one explosive public interaction, a drunk Harry yelled at Freddie, quote, Stop writing letters to my wife, you sex maniac. Harry also hated how Freddie openly showed disdain for the governor of the Bahamas, the Duke of Windsor. Freddie had once called him, quote, Not my favorite ex-king of England. Pretty funny, like the fucking cojones on this dude, blatantly talking shit about the guy running the island and like writing letters to Harry's wife. <laughs> also, like the letter writing thing is kind of bizarre. I mean, handwritten letters seem like a lot of effort. Yeah, but people were writing letters all the time back then. Like today, Harry would be like, get out of my wife's DMs, you sex maniac. <laughs> <laughs> totally, yeah. All right. So drama is building, building. I feel a murder coming on. The murder of Sir Harry Oakes. On Wednesday, July 7th, 1943, Harry went about his day in a normal fashion. He was due to leave the island and join his wife in Maine the following afternoon. Thus, it would be his last day in the Bahamas for several weeks. Harry dropped by Harold Christie's office to ask him to come pay homage to the new flock of sheep he had bought, an adventure aimed at improving food self-sufficiency on the island. Harold was eager to appease his wealthy friend and suggested they invite several reporters to publicize Harry's efforts. Calls quickly set this up. Next, the two went to Oaks Estate to play tennis with several others, followed by cocktails and a few more guests. Meanwhile, at St. George's Hotel, Freddie was flying solo while his wife was away on a recreational holiday in the U.S. He decided to have a dinner party and invited friends at the bar over to his house. A storm was brewing. Freddie's dinner party was lively. The Frenchman was a generous host, and although he was not much of a drinker, he kept the alcohol flowing for guests. The storm outside continued to build. Towards the end of the evening, the lights went out and candles were used to illuminate the evening's merriment. Rain could now be heard pelting the hurricane windows, and at around 12.50 a.m., guests began to leave. Any remaining stragglers hopped into Freddy's car and he drove them to their respective abodes. Freddy's cousin, George, was staying at his place and witnessed Freddy's comings and goings. At Harry Oaks's mansion, the festivities were a bit less lit. Harry and his guests ate dinner, then played several games of Chinese checkers. At Harry's party, in contrast to Freddy's, guests seemed keenly aware of the intensity of the storm outside. At 11 p.m., the group began to disperse. By 11.30, all the guests had left except for Harry's old friend, Harold Christie who had asked to stay the night. This did not seem out of the ordinary, as Harold had stayed over the previous night as well. By midnight, the staff had left, and only Harold and Harry remained in the house. According to Harold, he stayed in Harry's bedroom drinking whiskey for another half hour, then retreated to his room on the other side of the mansion. At 7 a.m. that morning, Harold trudged along the upper porch of the estate to Harry's bedroom. He intended to remind his friend of their meeting with the Nassau Daily Tribune's editor and reporter. A faint smell of smoke was in the air, and when Harold opened Harry's bedroom door, he was met with a ghastly scene. Lying in the majestic sleeping quarters was a charred and mangled corpse. It was the body of Sir Harry Oakes. His head had been battered with a spiked object, obliterating his skull. 
A Chinese silk screen adjacent to the bed was splattered with blood, as was the carpet. After bludgeoning Harry, the murderer had doused the bed and carpet in an inflammable fluid and set it alight. An electric fan was placed near the bed, presumably to rouse the flames. It instead scattered feathers from a pillow that had torn during the assault. The blundered fire had left Harry's remains partially scorched. On one side of his body, his pajamas had burned away, and his skin was covered in heat blisters. As if in a ghoulish finishing touch, goose feathers clung lightly to the millionaire's corpse. It would seem as though the fire was an attempt to cover evidence and make the murder look like an accident. Yet the storm that night had quickly put out the flames. Hours after the event took place, it was clear this was no accident. Harry had been murdered. In addition to botching the fire, the assailant had left clues. There were bloody handprints on the bedroom walls and into the hallway, as well as muddy shoe prints leading up to Harry's room. Despite the ineptitude of the killer, he somehow still managed to vanish into the night, never to be brought to justice. Thus, the question still remains. Who killed Sir Harry Oakes? our big moment. We're going to solve the case. I'm fucking ready. Hey. Okay. Let's take a look at the theories. Murdered by Alfred de Marnie. Count Alfred de Marnie was sort of a controversial figure on the island. He was popular with the island's younger, faster crowd and the ladies loved this handsome and charismatic Frenchman who regularly won sailing trophies with the yacht he smugly christened Concubine. Yet more traditional Bahamian society disliked the stereotypically arrogant Frenchman. They saw him as, quote, a foreigner, a dangerous womanizer, and a cad. Freddy did not have a great relationship with his father-in-law, and things seemed to be coming to a head in the weeks preceding Harry's murder. There were even rumors that Freddy had threatened to crack his father-in-law's head. The turmoil pushed Harry to change his will, preventing Nancy from getting any money until she was 35, a move that did not surprise her or her husband. Harry also took issue with Freddy's blatant negativity towards the Duke of Windsor. It was public knowledge that Harry and Freddy had recently engaged in a huge altercation when Freddy refused to attend a cocktail party given by the Duke. Freddy would later regret his behavior towards the exiled King of England when the investigation into his father-in-law's murder took an unexpected turn. As governor, the Duke had full jurisdiction over the case. Thus, the Duke decided to take control of the situation. He suppressed news of the murder for several days, then chose to call in outside help. This seemed to be a peculiar decision, as the local police were perfectly capable of handling the inquiry. Rather than calling in British personnel, the Duke randomly contacted two detectives from the Miami police, Captains Melchin and Barker. In a very suspicious chain of events, the detectives singled out Freddy. 72 hours after the murder, he was arrested. The trial was a sensational event, featuring a colorful cast of characters and theatrical courtroom drama. For the prosecution, their entire case essentially hinged on a fingerprint found on the Chinese silk screen in Harry's room. Yet when called to testify, the detectives could not prove that the fingerprint had been made the night of the murder, as the entire crime scene had been trampled upon by various persons, including Freddy. Simply put, it was contaminated from the get-go. Freddy was acquitted, yet in an interesting twist, the jury ordered he must leave the island immediately, despite being found not guilty. Okay, so just as a general note, I love that this delightful Pepe Le Pew character was woven into the story. Yeah, he's pretty great. 
It's also kind of interesting that Freddy and Harry's evenings kind of had these parallel qualities leading up to the murder. Right? <laughs> sort of eerie. But in terms of Freddy actually committing the crime, I mean, his motive seems flimsy at best. Uh, this French dude did not seem like an ambitious go-getter. He just seemed focused on finding chicks who were like DTF. Uh, you know, that was his MO, all the acronyms. Plus, Harry had written Nancy and Freddie out of his will in a way, so it would seem like Harry's worth more to the couple alive versus dead. Yes, okay, and without question, the super shadiness of the Duke of Windsor casts very heavy doubt on that physical evidence. I mean, like, how ridiculous was it that he brought in some, like, random cops from fucking Miami? I know, right? His instinct is to hire Crockett and Tubbs. Very sus. It kind of seems like everyone in charge just hated the Frenchman. And I love how he got voted off the island like it's a fucking reality show. <laughs> yeah, right. Fucking murder island or some shit. That would be an absolute hit in the UK. <laughs> oh my god, yeah, without a doubt. It ticks like all the boxes for a British reality show. Murdered by Harold Christie. Harold Christie was one of the island's premier businessmen. He initially built his fortune acquiring property from native Bahamians at bargain prices, reselling the land to rich white people. His business tactics offer a clear insight on who Christie was, an unscrupulous entrepreneur. Christie's sales talent was legendary, and it was Harold who had first persuaded Harry to move to the Bahamas. In doing so, he brought in wealth and prestige previously unseen on the island. But rumor had it, Harry was considering relocation to Cuba in another one of his wealth hoarding plots. Expunging Harry's funds from the Bahamas would have been devastating for Harold, as well as the Duke of Windsor. In addition to being the island's biggest benefactor, Harry was intertwined in various business ventures with Harold and the Duke that could dissipate if Harry took his fortune elsewhere. So, I mean, Harold was in the goddamned house when Harry died. How did he not hear this horrendous murder that was occurring just down the hallway? <laughs> right? I guess there was this thunderstorm happening still, but like, there had to be a ton of smoke and whatnot. I mean, there was a man on fucking fire down the hall. Like, how was Harold oblivious to this? <laughs> and like, you have to hear the statement he made describing the discovery of Harry's body. I went into the room and saw some smoke. Then I rushed to the bed and found Sir Harry with his clothing burned off. There were several raw spots on his body. For God's sake, Harry! I shouted and shook him. The body was still warm. I lifted his head and put a pillow under it. Took a glass of water and put some in his mouth. I got a towel and wet it wiped his face, hoping to revive him. I thought him still alive. <laughs> like, are you fucking kidding me? You thought this guy was alive. Uh, the charred skeleton in pajamas. <laughs> um, like, I'm no fucking doctor, but I'm thinking uh, CPR is a moot point at this stage. He needs water. He just needs some water. Oh, yeah, no, he's clearly just dehydrated. He'll be fine. Targeted for Mafia hit. A more ambiguous theory that has persisted claims that the Mafia was responsible for Harry Oakes' death. Rumor has it that Mafia kingpin Meyer Lansky sought to expand his gambling empire into the Bahamas, with the Duke of Windsor's approval and Harold Christie working to build the casinos. Under this theory, Harry was resistant to these plans, so he became the target for a hit. The idea first appeared in a 1972 book by Marshall Holtz, a former FBI agent, lawyer, author, and it certainly seemed plausible on the surface. FBI reports state that the Duke already had business with Lansky and that the two Miami detectives brought in to investigate Oakes's murder were on the mob's payroll. Yet, when considering the theory a bit further, problems arise. Although gambling was not a big tourist draw in the Bahamas, it was already legal there. Plus, 
Lansky and his partner Luciano didn't need the Bahamas. Outside of their lucrative enterprises in the US, they were making a fortune in their gambling ventures in Cuba. Okay, so what's interesting about this theory is that, like, the book that it came from was written during a time when there was a massive interest in mafia books. It was like right after The Godfather came out. So yeah, I mean, you gotta make shit marketable. Is that what we're doing with the true crime hook on this show? How dare you? This show is classified as super high art. <laughs> okay, I was waiting for like a laugh track or something to make it clear that we're aware that this show is pretty fucking stupid and like purely for entertainment value. If possible, if anyone could possibly be entertained by this. But it seems like our producer dropped the ball on that one. Reap your pigeon. Come on, man. What are you fucking doing? Murdered by Walter Foskett. Harry Oakes's personal lawyer exhibited some suspicious behavior, especially when considering his actions through the lens of Harry's death. Walter was the executor of the Oakes's estate, and he made some questionable transactions on behalf of Harry, some without permission. When Harry found out about one secret negotiation involving his artwork, the tycoon was irate. At the dinner party where Harry discovered Walter's indiscretion, he spouted that he was going to quote, see Fosquette in Miami or Nassau and straighten him out. The incident occurred just before Harry's murder, after which Fosquette moved quickly to take over the Oaks's estate, profiting handsomely from the tragedy. Plausible? Plausible. Sure. Makes sense. But there's absolutely zero evidence to back this up, so kind of worthless. It's fucking garbage. Absolute rancid filth that makes me sick to my fucking stomach just looking at it. I have no idea what we're talking about anymore. Me neither. Might be time to wrap it up. All right, so I guess to sum it up, uh... You know, Sir Harry Oakes lived a spectacular life, and it culminated in a spectacular death. For sure. His life was just like a roller coaster of super dramatic highs and intense lows. I guess it was eerily fitting that it would end in such a bizarre, unsolved murder. <laughs> yes, still very much unsolved. Um, there was a second there where we got a bit excited. We may have oversold the quote solving part of the show since we basically just regurgitated information that we found. But I mean, you know, come on. We're fucking cartoon dogs. Like, what did you expect? End of episode. <laughs>